Good evening, everyone. There's just another 30 seconds or so while we have a few more families joining uh, the Zoom call, and then we'll get started. All right, we are at 6.30, which is our start time. I wanted uh, to thank everyone for uh, choosing to join our session. My name is Jean Fulton-Hale. I'm the principal at Maryville High School. I'm going to uh, give the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves to you, and then we will begin our session with a land acknowledgement. So uh, passing it over to my colleague and the principal at Colonel By. Hi everyone, I'm Trevor Grills. I'm the principal at Colonel By. Nice to meet you. Lewis. Hi everybody, my name is Lewis Harthen. I am the uh, district coordinator for the IB programs at Maryville High School and Colonel By Secondary School. Uh, passing it over to you, Elizabeth. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Dutton. I'm the school-based coordinator at Maryville High School. And I'm Jennifer Lee, and I'm the school-based coordinator at Colonel Bai Secondary School. Together, uh, we are your panel to share the IB program information session for 2023. We begin our conversation this evening acknowledging that together we are working and learning on the unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin territory, home of the Anishinaabe. We are mindful of their enduring presence on the land and thank them for hosting us and, and sharing their learning with us each and every day. Uh, as we get into uh, this session, I want to reassure all people who are asking questions that uh, we are tracking the questions as they come up in the Q&A session. When the questions that are in the Q&A match where we are in the uh, presentation, I will be inviting the panelists to respond to the questions. I would also want to reassure everyone, this session is being recorded and the recording will be posted to the OCDSB website on the IB page. So uh, you don't have to worry about taking notes. All of this information will be available to you to revisit should you wish it. There is also a live stream on YouTube so that uh, there are other ways to access the information. Um, many of the questions that we're already seeing are in fact featured in the presentation. So I would encourage you to uh, learn alongside with us as we get started. Lewis, could you share the presentation? All right, do you want to uh, open the conversation, Mr. Harthen? Sure, um, so <clears throat> welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Um, up, up here, you can see a little bit of information about our uh, two IB World schools, um, Colonel By Secondary School and Maryville High School. Um, so we're very pleased to be able to offer uh, this program uh, across two schools in our school board. And so this evening, the purpose of it is to obviously uh, provide you with some information about the program, how it operates uh, in our schools. And uh, towards the end, we'll talk about the application procedure and things like that. And uh, along the way, hopefully answer a whole lot of your questions. And as Ms. fulton Hale said, uh, we know that we have uh, uh, several questions already in the Q&A, so uh, please be patient. We do try to get to every single one of them, um, but uh, it does sometimes take us some time to get through. So we appreciate your time tonight. Oops. Ooh, went too fast. Over to you, Ms. Fulton-Hale, to talk a little bit about Maryville High School. Great, thank you. Well, we know that uh, it's important for families to have a little window into the school that hosts the program where your student will uh, be applying. So. Um, we wanted to share a little bit about Marivelle uh, and the fact that um, 
all schools in the OCDSB have rich learning experiences. We're just very proud of the ones that we offer. Uh, incredible learning spaces for all disciplines. Uh, Marivelle High School has undergone significant uh, facilities renewal over the last six years. And so many of our spaces have been fully renovated, including our science labs, which has been a focus for the OCDSB. We have academics, athletics, and the arts, something for everyone. Your passion is an opportunity for you to uh, pursue it at school. And we have many, many teachers who are as excited about those opportunities as you are. Uh, like many schools in the OCDSB, we make sure that our grade nines arrive feeling welcomed and supported by their upper class mates. And our link crew program does that. So uh, for our new uh, incoming IB students, uh, we have a, a, an open house in May, just so that you have a chance to see the school and then welcome you properly in September with the rest of the grade nine class. Uh, amongst our programs uh, are experiential learning opportunities, including a specialist high skills major in communication design. And obviously a big part of our learning uh, as, as an IB World School is to make sure that you have a chance to get out there and interact with the world. So field trips and guest speakers. Our students give back through clubs, activities, and um, what we like to call signature events like Relay for Life. Big becomes small when you get involved. I think uh, this week we topped uh, 52 student clubs, uh, everything from crafting to uh, the production to robotics. So uh, if you can dream it, we can probably get it done. We look forward to welcoming you. Hi everyone, just wanted to uh, to welcome you to, to Colonel By and just uh, draw your attention to a few highlights of, of Colonel By. So we're located in the Beacon Hill neighborhood just in Ottawa's East End and we are a school of, of just under 1100 students. Uh, we have a vibrant arts program, so visual arts, drama, music. Uh, every year we put on a, a musical theater production and uh, often are, are winning awards for those productions. Uh, we have currently just over 45 active student-led clubs. Uh, anything that your mind can imagine, we typically would have a club. And the, the wonderful thing about high school is if there's a club that you're interested in and we don't have it, uh, often we can find ways to make that happen. Uh, we have a full complement of, of school teams that play in, in competitions against other schools. Um, uh, everything from junior boys soccer, all the way to diversity girls rugby, track and field. So lots of opportunities to get involved. Um, we have a specialist high skills major focused on digital broadcasting. Uh, and that's what you'll see when you visit our website, our Cougar Vision uh, daily announcements that are our visual uh, daily announcements. So uh, really great opportunity to get a window into the school to see, see what we, we do here. Uh, and just wanted to draw your attention to uh, a lot of what we do. It's uh, our excellent, amazing school spirit uh, with Spirit Week's theme days and a lot of community involvement just through our, uh, our community outreach and especially our two local uh, uh, charities that we really focus on, uh, which is the Gloucester Emergency Food Cupboard and Education Foundation. So really we're looking forward to meeting you all and welcoming you to the school. There we go. Sorry, folks, took me a second to unmute there. So thank you for uh, bearing with me. Um, and so thank you to both Jean and Trevor for introducing our, our, our two schools uh, that we're proud to have uh, this program at. And so um, we are going to talk to you a little bit in the next section uh, about the uh, International Baccalaureate Program, uh, Diploma Program, and how it functions uh, at our two sites. And so um, you can see a website there if you're looking for, and I think this is part of our FAQ as well, if you're looking for some more general information uh, about the International Baccalaureate Organization uh, who uh, offers these programs, uh, you can see that there. And so we wanted to talk a little bit tonight about what you can expect uh, at Maryville and Colonel By at 9 through 12 uh, being part of this program. And so we wanted to start a little bit with one of the things that is rather unique about Maribel and Colonel by Secondary School, 
And that is our delivery model uh, at the high school level uh, for this program and our Ontario programming. Um, so Colonel By Secondary School in Maryville are uh, what we would call non-semester. Uh, and what that means is uh, that our students are taking classes all year round. So you might know that um, a high school experience in a semester system kind of works like this. Um, over the course of the year, students will study eight classes and they begin the year at a semestered school with four classes that they would take every single day uh, from September uh, until about the end of January. And then those four classes would finish at a semestered school uh, and they would start four new classes from February until the end of June. And that would be the, how they would complete their eight classes um, at most high schools in the city of Ottawa. Maryville and Colonel By have a different delivery model uh, and that's the non-semestered system. And so what happens um, in a non-semester delivery model is students start the year with eight classes. And so how that works uh, just from a practical perspective uh, is that on Wednesday today, as an example, students at both schools uh, took four courses today. Um, and so they would take those same four classes again on Friday, if Friday wasn't a PD day here, but let's pretend it's not for a second. They would take those four classes again on Friday and uh, they would take their other four classes uh, tomorrow, which is the Thursday. So they would alternate uh, four, four, four and four, if you will, uh, throughout the entire school year. So they are getting instruction in those eight subjects uh, throughout the school year. And one of the big reasons we do that um, is it's one of the core sort of philosophies uh, in the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program um, that they really have this belief of concurrency of learning. Uh, and that's the idea that students, as they uh, grow older uh, during their years uh, in high school, so across grade nine, uh, there's a lot of growth that happens because of age. Uh, we want students to experience all subjects, or the IB wants students to experience all subjects across that entire year. So they get to take advantage of whatever growth in their learning that happens in all eight subjects. And so that is why we deliver uh, this particular program in a non-semester uh, fashion. And so you will have English class all year, math class all year, science class all year. Uh, and in some ways it's maybe similar to the experience that your child's getting right now in their eighth grade class. And for some of you who might be in ninth grade watching this, uh, it might be a departure from what you're used to in that semester system at the high school you're at. So let me talk a little bit about grade nine and 10. And so one thing that's um, big about this program is that uh, the IB diploma program is actually a grade 11 and 12 uh, program officially. So the official years of the diploma are the final two years of high school, which for us in Ontario is grade 11 and 12. And so in grade nine and 10, it's what we consider to be our pre-diploma program. Years. So uh, we start accepting students into the program uh, for ninth grade. And really what we're doing during that time is a variety of things. And so at the high school level, um, we know that we're trying to have students work towards their Ontario secondary school uh, diploma. And that's what all students at high school are working towards. Um, and that diploma program, uh, the OSSD as we call it, uh, has certain courses that are a requirement. And so your child in this uh, program for grade nine and 10, starting to earn the required credits to complete their high school diploma. In grade 11 and 12, we begin the IB diploma program requirements. And the important part here, and I just want to stress this in this part of the presentation, is uh, those requirements for the IB and the OSSD go hand in hand. And so effectively, I don't want people to think that this is something that they are necessarily doing on top. Those courses and, and the requirements do fit together. And so our IB diploma students, uh, when they finish grade 12, uh, graduate with both their IB diploma as well as their Ontario secondary school diploma. So they do meet the requirements uh, for both diplomas uh, by the time they are finished their time with us. In grade nine and 10, our really big focus uh, is on developing uh, the skill sets that we know are important to find success later on in our grade 11 and 12 uh, years. And so when your child is uh, at Maryville or Colonel By in grade nine and 10, we really are trying to focus um, on a slightly different skill set that, that we know ultimately the IB is uh, looking for. Um, and as we kind of go through our different 
uh, subject areas uh, in the next little bit, you'll hear from us, several of us about kind of the skill sets that we're looking for in those different subjects. So grade nine and 10 students are preparing for uh, this program and then grade 11 and 12 were actually the first full years of the diploma program. And so in front of us right here, uh, this is the diploma program curriculum model. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what this does at the high school level uh, and how it maybe uh, changes a student's high school experience being part of the diploma program, um, because it does do a few things. And so um, we talked a little bit about the Ontario Secondary School Diploma. And one thing that you may or, or may not know is that because it has its own course requirements, most of the Ontario Secondary School Diploma's course requirements are finished by about the end of 10th. Uh, there are still a few left and uh, we could go through them all, um, but the vast majority of courses are, are finished as a requirement uh, after 10th grade. There are, as I say, a few exceptions there. Because the IB diploma then starts in 11th grade, uh, it has a few different requirements um, that we then have to meet across those two years. And so one of the things that IB really values when it starts thinking about uh, subjects and subject areas is they really value well-roundedness. And so in front of us here in this diploma program curriculum model, um, you'll see six different sort of areas, uh, subject areas that IB considers crucial uh, to earning the IB diploma. And so what that means is our students in 11th and 12th grade uh, take one or more courses uh, from each of these subject areas. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time in the next bit uh, talking about some of those subject areas and talking about some of the skill sets um, that we work on with your child starting in grade nine and then ultimately uh, all the way through to grade 12. So the first uh, course subject that uh, IB considers to be important for students to study in 11th and 12th as part of their diploma years uh, is this course and this course area called Studies in Language and Literature. And so I'll put this kind of in practical terms uh, for everybody listening. What that means is you will be in English class uh, for all four years of high school. Um, those of you who might know the high school system uh, will know that every student uh, in Ontario takes four uh, years of high school English. Um, and so in some ways that requirement is sort of similar. Um, in the skill set perspective, the studies in language and literature course that we offer in IB, IB English, uh, we really focus in on uh, the meaning of words and how words kind of provide meaning to everything we read. And so it's a very uh, technical approach uh, where we try to really delve deep into how words actually bring meaning to what we read on a page, how they make us feel. Um, it goes a little bit beyond uh, just necessarily reading a book perhaps and being able to talk about what might happen in the book. We really try to delve down into the art of literature uh, across many different genres and many different time periods. Um, and so we're really kind of burrowing down uh, into uh, what makes that language tick. The second thing that is a requirement in this program um, is that IB considers, it's an international program, it considers uh, learning a second language uh, to be incredibly important. And so that's the language acquisition uh, portion of the diploma. All students are required to take a, a second language throughout high school. And so the one that, uh, if you're from Ottawa, uh, anyways watching this, I realize we might have people from all around watching this tonight, but uh, if you're from Ottawa, the language that we're very familiar with uh, here in the nation's capital is, is French. And I know um, from visiting different schools and speaking to uh, different people and, and their parents as well, um, French is obviously the one that we're very familiar with. And I know that from visiting there um, that we have a lot of students who might be in French immersion. Uh, so I did want to address this because it's one of the common questions we get. Uh, you are able to be in French immersion in the IB program. We do have that as an option you can choose uh, in your application. So you can earn the French immersion certificate from high school while meeting the language acquisition portion. Um, so we do have French as an option. Uh, because we're uh, IB World Schools, though, both Maryville and Colonel Baia actually have another language option for you to consider. Um, so you can consider Spanish uh, as an option uh, from both schools. And so we do offer that um, for consideration for students who maybe want to get an additional second language 
uh, in high school uh, who are possibly maybe looking for uh, an alternative to French if they are looking for something like that to study throughout high school. But language acquisition is a key part of the program uh, and we do want uh, you to be part of that. Our individuals and societies is our, our third group. Um, I sometimes call that the social studies because that's what uh, our, our students in grade seven and eight are very familiar with. And even some of our ninth graders might be familiar with that term. So um, IB requires students to study social studies all throughout high school. Uh, and so in that particular um, range of subjects, there's a lot of different skills that we uh, kind of go into. So we're really trying to focus on students uh, we are doing this in a lot of different subjects as well, but we're really focused on research skills in those particular subjects. We want uh, students to understand how to conduct um, in-depth research about the subject areas that they might be in. So in a history, we might look at historiography or something of that sort. Um, we're also asking them to uh, try some hands-on stuff. So in a geography course, for instance, we want them to get used to doing field study work. So we actually want them to get out and understand that Geography is a lot more than uh, just maps and flags and, and places on the planet. Um, so we ask them to get out sort of into the field uh, to do different work. And so that individuals and societies part, the skill set that we're building sort of goes beyond a, a notebook. And we kind of start looking into the field and trying to have people experience uh, that. And so building those skills early in ninth and 10th and into 11th and 12th is key. For the fourth group, the sciences, uh, I'm going to pass it off to our resident uh, science expert, uh, Miss Lee, uh, who, in addition to being the school-based coordinator, uh, generously uh, gives some of her time to also be one of our IB science teachers. So I'm going to let her talk about what happens in the sciences. Miss Lee? Sure, thank you. Uh, so in the sciences, we have a real uh, emphasis on developing inquiry skills. And so this is something that we start uh, right from, from grade nine, building to, to the grade 12 years. So in grade nine, it would start uh, maybe with just getting students to how do we ask testable questions? Um, students have this innate curiosity. Uh, how do we ask questions that we can then test uh, to, to find out what the answers are? So those are the kinds of things that we start with. Uh, as the students build through the uh, science courses up to grade 12, eventually they're going to get to where they are not only asking the testable question, uh, but then they are, are designing the experiment that will be uh able to answer that question, and then carrying it out, gathering the, the data, uh, analyzing the data, what does this tell us about the question that was originally asked, and then also analyzing their own experiment. Uh, what are the limitations in the methodology that they've chosen? Uh, so what can this tell us, and, and what are we uh, left still to do through perhaps some other experiments? So uh, there are required experimental hours for the IB program. Uh, and so the students get lots and lots of uh, hands-on opportunities to uh, explore science, ask these questions, and find out the answers. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about mathematics here. And so um, math is a requirement uh, to study all through high school uh, in the IB program. And so our mathematics courses um, that we have available have a pretty wide variety of ranges uh, for every single student. And so uh, I did get the opportunity to get out to our uh, OCDSB schools with uh, eighth grade. And uh, we had a little bit of a chat about math and uh, we had a little bit of a math question that we uh, talked about at each of those schools. And I'll make reference to that a little bit later. But for the IB program, uh, math is considered to be an important component. And so uh, math has a pretty wide variety of ranges uh, in terms of uh, what we explore. And so uh, on one end, we have a math course that will deal with almost all of first year university math uh, in, in some cases. And so we're really pushing um, students in terms of their math knowledge. Uh, we have courses that are far more geared towards what you uh, might experience in a grade 12 calculus class here uh, at high school. And so we have courses that are kind of devoted to that. We also have courses 
uh, that focus a little bit more on data management and statistics. And so for us, the math skills that we build uh, eventually contribute to students considering any of those possibilities uh, for their, their math. Um, we always like to say that we try to meet students where they are in their math journey uh, so everybody can feel comfortable because I know when I was out at schools, uh, some students definitely have a little bit of anxiety about math. And I do want to assure you that we do try to meet you uh, where you are in your math journey so that it is uh, a positive journey uh, through high school and math. Um, for the sixth group, I am going to uh, turn it over uh, to Ms. Dutton, who is our resident arts expert uh, and who also generously gives her time at Maryville High School uh, as one of our music teachers. And so, Ms. Dutton, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit uh, about the arts and some of the skills that we built there. Thank you. All right, so uh, in the IB Arts, um, really we're focusing in on creative thinking and critical thinking. Uh, in these courses, students are able to explore the diversity of the arts across time, cultures, and different contexts as they work on developing those skills. So we focus not just on the final product, but also on that creative process and how you got from your initial idea to that final process or product, sorry. So we, in all these arts courses, really focusing on how did that journey go from start to finish and reflecting through that process. There's also a really big emphasis, not just on developing those skills, but also working on the theory and the analysis side of things. So looking at the theory behind the arts that enable students to develop those creative thinking and critical thinking skills. Uh, overall, they learn to express their ideas in a creative way as they work through exploring, experimenting, and creating in the arts. Uh, and really overall, the aim is to enable students to enjoy a lifelong engagement with the arts. Back to you, Mr. Hartson. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Dutton. And so those are our six different subject areas, folks. So we have students kind of uh, exploring those six different areas. Um, and so one of the differences I will say sort of uh, at the high school level, um, and we kind of, I alluded to this earlier, is that uh, in our Ontario Secondary School Diploma um, version, we have students who are more or less met a lot of these requirements uh, by the time they are done the 10th grade. IB sort of extends some of these requirements into 11th and 12th, and so that does make the experience a little bit different. Uh, and again, the idea that IB has behind that is they want students to have a well-rounded uh, course grouping all the way through high school. Um, one piece just to add uh, to the arts um, is that, um, well, we definitely value the arts at, at Maryville and Colonel By, and, and IB does as well. Um, IB does invite you to consider uh, deepening your knowledge in the arts. It does in that particular group also allow you an option um, for uh, a situation if you're not feeling as artsy uh, or you like you do not want to uh, possibly pursue that later to take an additional second language, uh, to take an additional course in individuals and societies or to possibly consider an additional course in the sciences. So we do know sometimes that that is an option that some of our kids take. So that is the course option portion. Uh, and then what you can probably see if you look in the middle of our curriculum diagram here is we have a few other things that we'd like to talk to you about. And these are things that we think makes the program uh, very, very unique. And we kind of call them the core requirements of the IB diploma program. So we wanna spend a little bit of time talking about them um, because well, this is definitely the case in every single course and we'll talk We'll kind of link this back a little bit later. Um, these three things are kind of what we believe makes the program very, I always say this term, you-centric. And so it puts your student uh, at the center of the learning that's happening. So um, I'm going to, on this next piece, I'm going to turn this over to Miss Lee to talk a little bit uh, about the first you-centric portion, uh, something we call CAS, Creativity, Activity, and Service. And so uh, Ms. Lee, I'm going to let you speak to that. So thanks very much. Thank you. Yes, we often talk about CAS as the fun parts of the program. These are the uh, parts that the students get to do the things uh, that they are choosing to do anyway in their life outside of school. So as uh, Mr. Harthen says, the IB program values uh, well-roundedness among the students, and it values the experiences that they are choosing to participate in uh, outside of the classroom. 
And so CAS is their opportunity uh, to take part in those things, to learn from those experiences and to share what they've learned uh, as, as part of their pursuit of the diploma. Uh, so creativity, activity, and service. Students will participate in, in activities related to all three of these. Uh, some things that they might do would maybe just fall into one of those categories, and some might fall into two or even three. Uh, these, again, are things that students are doing outside of the classroom. Things it could be at school as part of clubs or sports that they are participating in at school. Uh, can be things that they're involved in uh, as members of the community with community organizations. Uh, or it could be things that they are choosing to do uh, on their own. And there's a huge range of, of choice, really anything that they would like to, to participate in, uh, whether that's sports for activity, whether that's um, music, uh, arts, whether that's creating something, uh, service organizations that they may be part of, volunteer work, all of these things uh, are, are open for them as CAS experiences. Uh, as the students participate in these things, what's really important is that we ask that they reflect on uh, why they're participating in these activities and what kind of uh, personal growth that they have, have gained, what are their, their next steps. Uh, for all of these things that students participate in, they are invited to select some learning outcomes that apply to, uh, to that activity. And so this reflection goes on, uh, ongoing throughout the program. We would ask them to reflect at the beginning. What are their goals for the activity that they have chosen? Uh, why have they chosen to participate in a certain way? How will they know when they have met these goals? Uh, the learning outcomes would also address things uh, such as the ethics of uh, the choices that they're making, um, it, planning their ability to initiate and plan as part of this uh, procedure. So it addresses a lot of those soft skills that will benefit them in the uh, classroom, but also beyond. And then as they go on participating in these activities over time, uh, we would like to see reflections from them that talk about, uh, again, their progress toward the goals that they have identified uh, and, and where they are going with that, where they're going next. Uh, so this really is this, this fantastic opportunity as part of the program uh, to continue to do the things that they like to do, to try some new things, to um, promote their own personal growth and uh, tell us all about where they've gone with those experiences. So I'm going to pass it on to Ms. Dutton now to talk about the next aspect of the core of the program, the extended essay. All right, so the extended essay, this is a 4,000 word research paper. And many students, when they hear 4,000 words, they might panic a little bit because it is quite a lot. Uh, it's much larger than what they're used to at this stage in their educational path. Um, and it's not something they might typically see until university or college. And so um, while it is a big task, there are some things we do want them to know about the extended essay. So the first thing is that it doesn't actually start until grade 11. So they don't have to worry about it in grade nine or 10. Uh, they'll start that in grade 11. And in grade nine and 10, as was mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the subjects is we do work with them on their research skills. So we are working up towards being able to take on a much larger task in grade 11. And while we start it in grade 11, it's not actually something that they will submit until grade 12. So they do get a good chunk of time to work on this. So it's not something that we assign to them and expect to, them to have it done a week later. So they do get a good chunk of time uh, to work on this. And one of the things that I think is really great about the extended essay is that the students do get some choice here. So this is another really great example about you know, it being very student centered, the students get to decide what subject they would like to write their extended essay in, and then which topic which in within that subject that they would like to explore. So this gives students a really great opportunity to explore something that they're interested in something they're curious about something they're passionate about something they want to learn more about. For some of our students, by the time they get to grade 11, they may know what they would like to study at the post-secondary level. So this also provides a really great opportunity for them to start exploring that subject in a little more depth. 
they also get assigned a teacher supervisor who acts as an advisor uh, as they go through this process. So they're there to answer any questions that the students may have, discuss any you know, issues with their research, perhaps there's a roadblock there, uh, and to kind of work through that process of writing a 4,000 word research paper. Um, the other thing I wanna mention about this is, as I mentioned before, it's not something that they're typically used to writing something this large, um, but this does provide students with a really great opportunity to you know, try a much larger task before they head off to university or college. And so many find that those skills that may be required later are now being developed a little earlier on as they work on how to organize their time and take on that research and, and work towards completing something that's 4,000 words. Mr. Hartman, back to you. Great, thank you, Ms. Dutton. And so, yeah, thank you to both Ms. Lee and Ms. Dutton for that for those pieces on CAS and the extended essay, which is our, our two first uh, core requirements uh, for this program. Um, and so now we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about the, the third re core requirement for this program. Um, and that is a theory of knowledge class. And so theory of knowledge is, is a class that you take in 11th and 12th grade um, in the IB program. And so this might seem like an odd slide to start with, um, but as I kind of have mentioned earlier, uh, I was really lucky I got a chance to go into OCDSB schools and I, I try to visit all of our schools with a grade eight program. Um, and go in and have a little bit of a chat with, with students uh, about this opportunity that they have for high school. And so um, I know Ms. Fulton Hill has shared with me that uh, we have many a raindrop uh, question in our Q&A right now. And so um, some of our, our students who uh, experienced me ask a TOK question related to raindrops uh, might know what I'm talking about at this point. Uh, and, and adults sitting at home maybe uh, with their kids, if that makes no sense to you, it's a worthwhile question to ask your kid, uh, kids after uh, about the raindrop question. But here's, I thought we would do a little bit of an activity uh, tonight with you sitting at home um, that's TOK related and, and might actually explain why I have sneakers uh, up on the screen here. And so, um, typically, as I said, I go into schools and, and I ask, a question uh, every single night. And so uh, I'm gonna try to do this virtually for you at home and hopefully maybe you're, uh, maybe you're sitting with somebody watching this presentation and so you can play along together. Um, and, and even if you're not watching it with somebody, you can maybe do this in your head. So usually how I like to structure this question is uh, I say that there's uh, one rule to the question I'm going to ask. And that rule is that when I ask the question, uh, I need you to think of the answer in your head uh, but not say it out loud. And so I'm maybe going to ask you to indulge me uh, for just uh, maybe 35, 40 seconds as we play this game. So the question I'm going to ask tonight uh, is in regard to the shoes that you see on the screen. And so the question for tonight, and remember, the only trick if you're sitting with somebody is you have to think of the answer in your head but not say it out loud. The question for tonight is what color are the shoelaces on the shoes? And so I want you to think about that answer in your head. Don't say it out loud if you're sitting beside somebody. And then what I'm gonna ask you to do is, on the count of three, if you're sitting with somebody, I'd like you to turn to them and say your answer to that shoe color, the, of those shoelaces out loud. So let's just play along. One, two, three. And so hopefully you've had a chance to say the shoe color you were envisioning uh, to the person or persons you're sitting with. And so my hunch is that in some cases, what happened uh, at home for you is um, you did not say the same answer to one another. You might have had a, a different color for what those shoelaces are. Some of you might have said blue. Some of you might have said light blue. Some of you might have said turquoise or aqua or whatever word you might have chosen. And so usually I'd like to get into a longer conversation uh, with you about why we might have all had different answers uh, in this particular situation. Um, but ultimately what I like to bring it back to is what theory of knowledge class is really uh, about. And believe it or not, it's not necessarily concerned with what color uh, those shoelaces are, um, but what it's really interested in is how you came up with uh, the answer you came up with in your head. 
And so, as I always like to say, there's one trick to the question. And that question, that trick was, what did you think about in your head? So here's are the questions we sort of concern ourselves with. We always ask ourselves this sort of fundamental question in TOK, how do you know what you know? And so let me walk you through that shoelace question just for a second. So when we have a look at it, um, you might know the answer to be, let's say, blue. And somebody else might know the answer to be turquoise, for argument's sake. What we say is, why did you come up with that answer in your head? What experience led you to believe that the answer was what you thought of in your head? And so we always start with you. And this is where it gets back to that you-centric model that we talked about. We always start with the student uh, as the learner, as the person who has knowledge. And so we say, look, you knew what that color was in your head. You had that as knowledge. How did you arrive at knowledge? And so sometimes we have, um, anytime I've done the shoelace question, we have somebody say, look, when I was little, somebody might say, when I was little, um, I used to have um, crayons. And, and in my crayon box, anytime I saw that color, it said blue or it said aqua, it said that. And so I drew on my experience of those crayons to come up with the answer, with what I thought the answer was, because that's when I learned it. I learned it when I was in kindergarten. And so I've always thought of that color as that. And somebody else might say, you know what? Uh, when I was 10 years old, uh, my mom bought me a sweater and she told me it looked just like that. She told me this sweater was this color. I've always kept that memory with me. And so I think it's this answer. And so in TOK, what we try to do is we always start with how do you know what you know? So what experiences have led you to believe um, what you thought of in your head? Uh, and then we kind of branch out from there. We kind of ask questions like, um, let's say, I'll use Miss Lee as an example. Let's say both Miss Lee and I uh, believe the answer to that shoelace question was aqua. Um, but Miss Lee's um, experience with it might have been from a sweater, and mine might have been from the crayon box. If we each got to the answer using different experiences, is it the same knowledge? How can we arrive at knowledge from different experiences? And so, we have kids ponder that. We actually have kids think about how what they experience matters and how them as individuals with experiences, how they matter. So we try to make them understand that they're important when it comes to knowledge. And so we put them at the center of that. And then we kind of branch out. We ask them a secondary question. We say, you know what? If you believe uh, that the answer is one thing, could you understand how somebody else's experiences might lead them to a different answer? So could you understand, for instance, could I understand why Miss Lee believes um, those shoelaces are one color uh, and I might believe that they're a different color? Could we each understand and, and get some understanding around that? And then the third piece that we do there in TOK is, and we always call this the, the hardest part uh, for anybody to do, student or adult, we ask them to think about their answers and how it might be possible, and I'll use Miss Lee and myself again as this example, um, if she believes the answer to be one thing and I believe it to be another, can we understand how both of us within our experiences might also be right? Uh, and so that part is always the trickiest part. And so um, when I went out to see uh, some of the students in school, I usually give this as an example. And, and students, maybe you're sitting with uh, your adult at this particular moment. So I'll let you reminisce about the last time this happened. But I often ask students uh, if, they has, if they have ever had a disagreement with the adults at home. Um, adults, in case you're wondering, almost universally, all the hands go up. Um, and so we have that conversation. And, we, and usually what I like to ask them is, okay, well, let me guess. That conversation went like this. You said something to your adult. They said something back. And then I know because you were a really, really great kid, you said, you know, now that I consider it, because you are older than I am and you have so much more experience, you are probably right about this. I, I totally accept what you have just said. That That's entirely right. We're going to go with what you just said. And then usually what happens is all the kids laugh because that was not their experience of a disagreement with an adult at home. And so we talk about that, but then we say, look, in this program, what we want you to do is we don't want to change what you think, but we do want to get you to the point where you're able to consider how everybody else thinks. Because what we know about our world 
we have a very global world. We have people with very different experiences and we want to help shape our students um, to the point where they can consider multiple experiences um, from anybody, whether it is their next door neighbor or whether it's somebody who lives in a different country anywhere in the world. What becomes really fascinating about this uh, TOK portion is that, and you can kind of see it on the, on the slide here, um, TOK is actually one of the things that is cross-disciplinary, but it's also the glue that binds the entire program together. And so you hear, you heard us talk about those six different subject areas that kids take courses in throughout the program. TOK is actually purposefully infused in every single one of those courses. And so every single bit of IB curriculum um, that is designed by the International Baccalaureate Organization, every single bit of that that we deliver to students is infused with TOK. So they are constantly asking questions of knowledge. So for instance, in a science uh, course, uh, we might say, we call this a law of science. What does that actually mean? We actually might break that down, have kids think about that. What, what do we mean when we use that word? And in something like science, it might become cross-disciplinary. So when we hear the word law, does that mean what we think it means in terms of our understanding of it in the English language and how it's used in science? Um, and so we kind of go very cross-disciplinary. And in fact, one of the things that I hear in both schools, uh, when I go down a, a corridor sometimes, or I, I might dip my head into a class, is uh, I hear students say this. Uh, very often they say, that is so T-OK. Uh, and that might sound um, a little bit silly, but um, kids really start thinking about this as something to consider in all different facets uh, of what they do. And for me, that's one of the very, very cool parts about this program is that it is purposefully interdisciplinary. All of the subjects speak to one another through this language of TOK. And so that really unifies a student's uh, experience in this program. Now, usually as soon as I finish the TOK part and uh, we have fun with the shoelace question or we have fun with the raindrop question that some of the kids might be familiar with, I then usually uh, mention this part. And uh, usually the fun sometimes changes in the room. The fun meter might uh, fluctuate a little bit, but um, I always like to talk about this part a little bit because we know that kids have questions about it. Uh, and so I always like to say there is homework in the IB program. Um, but I always like to mention this part. I think this part's important. Uh, I always like to point out to students who might be in the eighth grade when I'm giving this presentation that they likely from time to time have to do homework in their grade eight school. Um, I like to point out to students that the reality is that high school, wherever you go to high school, is going to have homework. And, and that's a reality of high school anywhere you go. Um, and then I like to say, and the IB program also has homework. Um, probably one of the things that is a little bit different about our program uh, is that the homework tends to be very consistent. And so what I mean by that is it's unlikely that uh, students after a day of learning uh, will not have something to do at home, okay? And so usually, typically, students are going home with work to do uh, from our classes. Um, I always like to joke a little bit here and, and, and kind of throw in a bit, um, a few things that I can usually say confidently about a student's experience moving into ninth or, or 10th grade here. Uh, Colonel Byer Merivelle is that your video game high scores will go down. So I apologize to students out there right now. Um, your texting speed might decrease. I know that is might also be troubling for students. Um, adults, for you, I will tell you that if your child comes home and you say, do you have anything you have to do tonight? And they say, no, you might want to double check. That might not be entirely accurate. Uh, and so typically speaking, um, students do go home with work to do. A really popular question, and I can already tell you it's likely in the Q&A section, is how much homework is homework? Uh, and so I always like to be transparent about that and let, and let families know and students know. Uh, typically, I would say a ninth and 10th grade experience. It's probably not uncommon for uh, students to go home and have about an hour to an hour and a half of work uh, to do after each school day. I don't think that's uncommon. Sometimes if there are assignments or tests coming up, students might spend a little bit more time preparing for those. And so that can fluctuate. Um, 
And we do like to tell you that when it gets into grade 11 and 12, that can sometimes increase by a little bit. Uh, it is always student dependence and, and sometimes it's how you study. And one of the things I know we focus on at both schools is trying to help you learn how to study and to study properly and study well so that you're using your time effectively. Time management is a big part of this program. And so that's one of the skills we also focus on. But definitely, uh, there is work uh, for sure in this program. And that kind of brings me to um, one of my favorite slides, the why portion. And so um, definitely when I get to visit schools, we talk about this. And so I always like to summarize it a little bit like this. Um, if you're still with us to this point, you'll know that in this program, uh, nine through 12, one of the things we talked about was there would be six different subject areas that you would effectively be taking all through high school. And possibly if you chose another option, you might not do that. And so there are six subject areas that you have to continue through high school. We talked about three core requirements. We talked about uh, CAS, creativity, activity, and service, and how students have to reflect on who they are as, as people and kind of focus on who they are outside of the classroom. And so they really have to get involved with who am I? Um, why do I do things? And so they have to ask kind of bigger questions uh, beyond just necessarily doing an activity. So we ask them to kind of think of their personal growth, and that's a big thing. We ask them to write an extended essay, which is a 4,000 word research paper, which if we're gonna be honest, doesn't exist in other programs. And so Ms. Stetton, I thought did a great job talking about why we do it and why we build those skills, but effectively a, a 4,000 word research essay can sometimes still feel like a 4,000 word research essay. And so we always say students might be thinking, okay, why am I gonna do that too? And then we get to TOK, this uh, really fun course, in my opinion, but some people are still wondering, I know from my grade eight presentations, how many raindrops are there or what color are those shoelaces? And so um, it definitely asks kids to consider courses in a way that previously they might not have. And so I always think at this point, it's a very fair question to say, if you're a student sitting at home, well, why am I gonna sign up for this? Like, wh why should I be interested in this? What's the benefit for me? I just heard I have to do a whole bunch of homework too. So why am I gonna choose this as an option? And at this point, I always like to say, I have two things that I like to talk about uh, in this portion. And so uh, the first one uh, is kind of this. And so part of this uh, and part of what happens uh, in the IB program and you, it is a program we can find pretty well all around the world. It's a common curriculum all around the world that schools deliver. One of the reasons you can find this program all around the world is because it's very well respected all around the world. And so one of the groups that really respect this program are colleges and universities. And in fact, they go so far as to recognize it uh, by granting students first year college and university credits. Um, dependent on the work that they do in this program. So students do uh, IB courses here in high school uh, and they are potentially eligible to earn college and university credits before they set foot uh, in college or university. Depending on the college or university, some go so far as to put students directly into second year uh, in their school. Don't even have students do first year. And so that varies from college to university. We always encourage people to have a look at schools that their child might be interested in because there are different policies there. But that might be one reason that you consider it because it is getting you to that point. Um, there is that portion. Um, but that's not my favorite reason, actually. My, my favorite reason is actually the next slide. This is kind of where I believe uh, in for kids. And so it's not that I just love fall foliage. It's not related uh, to trees or anything like that. Um, but it is actually focused a little bit on, on the fall. And so one of the things that happens in the fall uh, for most colleges and universities is they often have a fall reading week. And so um, fall reading week is typically when students might return from wherever they've gone to college or university. Um, and they come in and, and they often will revisit their high school to say hi, to let us know how they're doing. We always appreciate that. Uh, inevitably, we are always happy to see them, um, but inevitably we always ask this one question, almost always. We always say, so how's first year going? How, how are things like ultimately, how are you feeling? 
And I can tell you that pretty universally, the feedback we get is, oh, it's going really well, actually. Um, I'm actually really enjoying first year. Um, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm being, I'm involved in a whole bunch of different stuff. And the workload doesn't actually seem all that different than what I was prepared to do last year in high school. And so I know I have, you know, my roommate feels like they're doing a lot more work and, and they're not quite sure how they're managing this, but I actually feel really at ease. And last week, my, my professor said that we had to write a 2000 word essay. And a lot of the kids in the class seemed a little bit bothered by that. I wasn't sure what the big deal was. I've already written a 4,000 word research essay with you. I already have that skill. And so for us, what we really believe in is that this program helps students transition from college to university um, by introducing them to a lot of the skills that we know that they're going to need uh, to be very successful and to have them develop the work skills um, that lead to a smooth transition. So for me, it's actually the smiling faces I get to see uh, for fall reading week when people come back to see me. So that's why I believe in this program. It's why I think it is a great reason to consider it. Uh, I think that transition uh, can be a big step for students going from high school to university, um, much the same way as I know a lot of our families watching this are in uh, eighth grade and maybe some of them are anxious about the jump from eighth grade to high school. Um, and so what we try to do is make that transition from high school to college or university really simple. And so for us, that's why I really believe in this program. It's why I think kids and families should consider it. So let's get into the okay. So I'm considering it. How do I go about applying for this program? And so um, our program does have an application uh, right now. Uh, you can find that application on the OCDSB website. And I believe both Colonel Bai's page and Maribel's page will redirect you to that website for information. And so that, uh, that application is up right now. And so there's a couple things we want you to be made aware of uh, for, for this application. The first part uh, is we ask you to submit it from a Google uh, email address. If you are in the Ottawa Carleton District School Board, or the OCSB, uh, I know for sure that your emails are Gmail addresses, even though they might have the school boards ending on it, they are Gmail addresses. Um, so we do ask you to submit something uh, from one of those spaces uh, to help us with that application. We also have a few different parts to our application. So I just wanna spend a few minutes talking about those. We have an IB application questionnaire. Uh, in that questionnaire, you get a a uh, series of questions, and it's an opportunity for you to tell us as the applicant a little bit about yourself. So we want to learn about uh, who you are, primarily what are the things that you are involved in. So it might be at your school, it might be somewhere in your community, but we want to get to know you. We want to get to know uh, kind of what your interests are, what your passions are, and why you might be interested in this program. So that's an opportunity for you to show us a little bit about your personality and who you are. We have a math exercise that we ask students uh, to uh, sign up for. And so what you'll see in the application is we offer uh, two different times for students to sign up. Uh, Mr. For them. Yes. I, I just wanted to uh, have you flag that there is a typo in the uh, math exercise um, link, but uh, we we do know about it. A number of families have flagged it to us. The year is incorrect. It was a typo, but the date itself is correct. Perfect. Thank you for letting me know. We'll make sure to adjust that. 23 to 24. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so yes, it is correct. Thank you for bringing that up, whoever did. Um, so in the uh, math exercise, we are going to ask you to sign up for one of those two dates, and we will correct the actual year correctly, but the dates are correct. Um, and so please pick up one that you feel like you can uh, sit for. It is an hour in length, the math exercise, okay? Um, it is completely multiple choice. It is something that students do from their home, okay? So you can do it from your home or anywhere else that you have access. We have an, I, what, we have an OCDSB IB English writing exercise. Uh, what that writing exercise is, is we give you a series of photos. We ask you to choose a photo. 
uh, we ask you to complete a task with that one photo that you have chosen. So you have a little bit of choice in how you respond to that photo. And there are instructions on the writing exercise as to lengthen everything else that we're expecting. We then ask you for um, the name of a teacher reference, okay? Uh, and so that teacher reference uh, should be one of the teachers teaching you this year, okay? So we do want it to be a current teacher. So if you're in eighth grade, it should be an eighth grade teacher. If you are in ninth grade, it should be one of your ninth grade teachers. It can be any subject. Uh, it can be any teacher as long as they have you this year. Uh, we contact them typically uh, in January. Okay, so we will contact them in January after your applications have been submitted. Uh, and so we reach out to them and we ask them questions about what uh, students are like in the classroom. So that's where we focus uh, that conversation. And I'm sure I might have skipped it, but the last piece of evidence we ask for is for you to submit your November progress report. Okay, so we do ask you to submit your progress report. Uh, they should all be uh, in your inboxes, and if not, your homeschool could probably help you with that, um, getting that progress report. If you are at a school that doesn't do progress reports, and we do know from time to time that we have schools that do other or alternate reporting measures, uh, we just ask that you submit your most recent reporting document from that school, whether it's called a progress report or something different. So the final date for submission uh, for all of these documents uh, is December 20th at 6 p.m. So that gives you about a month to get everything finished. Uh, and so please take a moment to have a look at, at that. We do get quite a few applicants for this program. Uh, we usually have well over a thousand applicants every single year. So it does take us a while to consider everything that has been submitted, but we always try to get back to families uh, prior to March break is always our goal. Um, Ms. Fulton Hill has a big smile on her I do, face. So. I do, because I'm going to interrupt you. Um, oh, there have been quite a few questions in the chat about applications, and I think this is a great opportunity for you sure. to talk about uh, the anonymous process and that all applications are considered equally. Yeah, yeah, great point. So what happens um, from the application portion is you will submit uh, via our, our sort of Google submission form uh, all of the information. What happens after you've submitted that is every single piece that I've just discussed that we're gonna look at with the exception of the report card, which is reviewed separately, uh, everything is anonymized from the perspective of the, the file names. So we do ask you uh, to not put your name on your English writing exercise or uh, anything of that sort, but or your application questionnaire, but we do anonymize everything. So. Uh, when we have people reviewing applications, uh, we don't know who you are. Uh, it is linked to your digital submission. And so ultimately it does get tied back later. But as we are considering things, uh, everything is anonymous. Uh, we strive for equity in our, our application process. And so that's one of the ways we uh, try to ensure that for you. Uh, we are looking at every single piece, not knowing who has submitted that. A um, couple of questions about students who um, either applied last year but were waitlisted, who are reconsidering this year, uh, thinking about their application pieces and um, what what are some uh, considerations that we might have for them uh, in terms of resubmitting. And uh, please know that all applicants receive an email indicating the status of your application, but that um, you would not get supplemental communication unless your status is changing from waitlist to offer. Yes. So we have two entry points uh, for the program for, for applicants. So if you are in eighth grade this year uh, and you apply, uh, we obviously we consider your application as an eighth grader. Um, should you not be offered a spot in the program uh, for next year for ninth grade, you always have an option as a ninth grade student to apply one more time uh, for 10th grade. And so we do provide two different entry points uh, to the program for students. And so if you're in ninth grade, uh, this would be the final opportunity uh, from an application perspective to enter the program. And uh, like the reason why we want your current teacher to be your reference, we always want you to have your most current uh, thinking and ideas and um, 
perspective considered in your application. Uh, so we expect um, current 2023 uh, thoughts and ideas from you. Uh, there were a number of questions, Mr. Harthen, about the math exercise and um, how students uh, will be completing that. So I wonder if you could talk briefly about that. Yeah, absolutely. So what will happen for the math exercise is uh, students will select a time in their application form to us. And so you'll select which time you will be taking uh, that math exercise. And what will happen is we will follow up with a supplemental email uh, to both groups. So there will be two possible seating times. We'll follow up with a supplemental email, uh, which will have the link to that math exercise. And so that link will become live at the time of the math exercise. So as an example, um, if you choose 11 to 12 on a Saturday, um, that link will become live from 11 to 12 on that Saturday that you've chosen to sit the math exercise. So before then, if you clicked on it, it will say it doesn't work. Uh, but then as soon as much like this link, as soon as we open the session, uh, you'll be able to join and take part in that math exercise. Mr. Harthen, did you want to comment at all about how students can um, prepare or get ready for this? Uh, we do not typically promote any extra activities for that. No, we do not. And so the grade, the, the, the math exercise itself is skills based. And so it's not curriculum focused. It's the best way to prepare for this. And, and I think I said this in a couple of schools I visited. Uh, is to do your work in math class and to build those skills in your current school uh, in math class. And so the work that you're doing in math class right now, whichever school you're at, is sufficient preparation for this exercise. There's, there's no need to go out and try to find a different book to study from or, or anything of that sort. The skills that you are developing right now in school are, are more than sufficient uh, for this math exercise. Okay, um, I am going to put a few other panelists to work here, Mr. Harthen. Um, Mr. Grills, could you talk a little bit about uh, student transportation for students who live outside of walking distance to either school? Absolutely. So um, for students that live more than 3.2 kilometers from the school, they are uh, eligible for transportation. The type of transportation and what they get um, is, is often is up to OSTA, so the Ottawa Student Transportation Authority. Often that, that looks like a presto pass for, for students, uh, but we do have students that um, in situations do come in a bus or in vans, uh, but we are in no way in, uh, in control of what options students get. Uh, we're just looking at the distance from, from the school. All right, there have also been a number of questions about um, the IB school locator and the boundaries. Those boundaries are district boundaries. And so that is to uh, balance opportunities for students uh, to access the program at either Colonel By or Maryville. Uh, so uh, Mr. Grills, uh, skill testing question, can a student apply to both programs? Uh, so you apply to the program in general and based on your address is where you will get the offer. So please make sure to check your home address with the IB School Locator, which is on uh, the OCDSB uh, page. Uh, Mr. Harthen and Ms. Lee and Ms. Dutton, coming back to you for a question on um, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, and are we actively instructing uh, with a mind to appropriate use of this magical technology? Yeah, that's a great question and a very timely question, perhaps, I guess, uh, especially if anybody's uh, looked at the news and open AI and, and things like that that are happening at that particular company. Uh, and so, yeah, we're very mindful uh, that uh, AI is, uh, is here and, and has actually probably been here for a while if we think about it. Um, and so our focus here uh, at both schools is the responsible use of AI. Uh, and so we see it as something that can be a positive tool and one that we want uh, students to definitely have exposure to and develop skills working with. Uh, but we also want them to understand that there is responsible use of AI. So there are good ways to use any tool and there are bad ways to use any tool. And so we really try to have students understand where it can enhance their learning uh, but we also want them to understand that in certain cases, it's going to take away from them. So uh, we want them to kind of get experience using it, 
And so as such, we promote it as a, as a possible useful tool for students, but we also teach them how to effectively use that tool. So yes, we definitely uh, have that in mind when we're going through our courses. All right, um, operational question for uh, Ms. Lee or Ms. Dutton. Um, students are asking a lot about the Gmail email uh, requirement. So could you please just uh, give um, a little bit of clarity as to why that's important for us? Sure, I'll take that one. Um, so the OCDSB email is a Gmail based system. Uh, so that is the email that we would like them to use if they are OCDSB students currently, uh, they should use that email for completing the form, uh, the, the Gmail form. If they are not using an OCDSB or a, a Gmail based system, we would ask that they would create a Gmail account so that they'll completely be able to uh, submit that form and they will get a copy of their responses sent to them when they have hit submit. So that's that's sort of the key point. Uh, once you hit submit, you should automatically receive a response, a copy of your responses, and that lets you know that we have received them. Right. Uh, Ms. Dutton, um, is a second language a requirement for an IB diploma? Yes, it is. <laughs> so um, the students have a couple options for that, but it is one of the subject areas for the IB diplomas picking up a second language. So it is a requirement. Thank you. Um, perhaps we could talk about the three levels of language for students who may be new to additional language learning. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, I made some reference to French immersion earlier, and, and I think I saw at least a few questions in the chat. Uh, we do also offer uh, English uh, programming in the IB, and so we do have core French as an option for students as well. Uh, and then we also have Spanish, of course, uh, as a third language option. Uh, when we look at language learning uh, across the IB, we do have a lot of different levels, and so if French or Spanish are not uh, a language that you've had a lot of experience with. Uh, IB does have something called, uh, we call it ab initio, uh, so it's Latin that IB uses in that particular situation, and what that means is from the beginning. So there is an assumption for uh, our languages that we might have a student who is brand new to either French or Spanish, um, because they may have come from a country or somewhere where neither of those languages was spoken. Uh, and so we do allow students to access the ab initio level in those languages. Uh, so that might be an option for students who are English language learners or uh, who might be just new to those particular uh, languages. Thank you. Um, a question about um, the DELF language levels. And I wonder if you wanted to talk about DELF at all. Yeah, so DELF is uh, an option. It's uh, for those of you who don't know what DELF is, uh, it is a certification provided by the French government uh, for French speakers. Uh, and so all of the students at Maribel and Colonel Bly uh, have the opportunity to participate in, in DELF testing. And what happens uh, at that uh, testing is they then are given a language certification uh, by the French government that they might use to take. And that happens uh, at the end of high school. All right, um, Mr. Grills, I wonder if you could comment on why we value uh, field trips as part of our learning and um, talk a little bit about our students in grades nine and 10 co-located with their Ontario uh, classmates. Great. So uh, in terms of the experiential learning or field trips, um, we really try to find opportunities that, that, that allow our students to connect with the curriculum outside of the classroom. And so um, both schools um, take uh, field trip opportunities to, to make those connections as much as possible. And so different subjects go different places, go at different frequencies. And so uh, there are those opportunities uh, available. It's, it's one of those, um, those opportunities that we really look to, to embrace. 
Um, and as uh, Ms. Fulton Hill just mentioned, um, our IB students actually have classes um, in, in classes with, with just their fellow IB peers and as well with our, our, our larger cohort or with our Ontario program students. And so um, they do have opportunities to have some classes um, with, our, with the entire grade nine school population, um, depending on the class. Great, thanks. Uh, Ms. Dutton, can you tell us the uh, five grade nine subjects that are pre-DP uh, or IB cohort, please? Um, hey, this is really testing me. <laughs> um, <laughs> English, I believe. Someone can correct me because I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure. English, um, geography, no, yes, geography, French, science, and math. Awesome. Um, Mr. Harthen, could you talk a little bit about um, why we are a diploma track school um, versus uh, AP or certificate? Yeah, um, so part of the IB diploma program, and I, I wanna stress that last word program, uh, is this particular program, how it differs from some of the other pieces, um, we really value that core experience. So I'll talk a little bit about diploma versus what some people might call certificate. Um, and so we really value that diploma experience because of the unifying factors that our core programming gives. So when we talked about those three core requirements, we consider them crucial uh, to an IB learning experience. And those definitely make it a little bit different uh, than a certificate option, which might be where a student takes one or two IB courses and doesn't maybe engage in the entirety of uh, what we talked about. Um, likewise, uh, in our AP uh, examples, uh, advanced placement, for those of you who are wondering, um, that is an exam that typically uh, students take at the end of their high school course, uh, and they might access it that way. Um, but for us, the diploma program is really something that has a full written curriculum that brings everything together into one place. And so for us, it's a program that focuses on your child as a whole student, and not just a student in the classroom, um, but a student of life. We really want them to develop as people. Uh, and that's kind of one of the key things and one of the reasons why we value the whole diploma and we are a full diploma track school uh, at both sites. Uh, Mr. Harthen, there have been a number of questions about do we provide um, past versions of the application? Yeah, um, I, I think if you were looking at uh, the OCDSB website, I, I know we uh, turn it over at some point to the new application year, so somebody might have been able to see a past application. Um, but typically, uh, no, we don't provide the past application. What I can assure anybody who uh, might be hoping to have seen that is that the application structure for the past few years hasn't changed. And so um, there's not really an advantage to seeing last year's photos for the English writing exercise, for instance. It's the same exercise, just with different photos. Uh, likewise, for the application questionnaire, uh, while we do tweak some of the questions, it is still focused on a student's experience outside of the classroom and kind of telling us who they are and what they do. So there's not really an advantage to having seen that. And so no, we, we don't provide past copies. Uh, we have, I, I've seen a number of questions. Uh, students are already thinking ahead to course selection. Um, I want to reassure you that once um, the uh, information has been communicated out to families about whether an offer is being made or if a student is waitlisted. Each school does run uh, the grade nine pre-diploma course selection process specifically with the students who have been given an offer. So um, that process will be fully supported by the two schools and the guidance teams. Um, that, that is not a concern. Uh, Mr. Harthen, we've had a number of questions about uh, families who are outside of the OCDSB who may um, have students either in, currently in an IB World School in an MYP program. Uh, can you talk about why it's important to apply to grade nine? Yeah, so um, 
importantly, from that application perspective, uh, we do ask families who are applying from abroad, and we do know that each year we have uh, several families that are applying from abroad, uh, that they do have to uh, have an area of the city in which they will be residing. So we, we do ask them to uh, consider that part. Uh, and importantly, they must reside in that part of the city um, by the time they are attending school here. Um, so that part is uh, important. So uh, our OCDSB school locator, uh, if you go to that particular page, you can also find uh, boundary maps, which will give you an idea of uh, whereabouts you might live in the city. From the middle years program perspective, um, what I will say is middle years programs uh, do tend to vary across uh, different schools. And so uh, the diploma program is actually the only program that IB offers that has a formal curriculum attached to it. And so it actually uh, talks about the things that we will be teaching and instructing your uh, children in uh, every single day, uh, whereas the middle years program is a framework for education uh, that a school puts over their local curriculum. Uh, and so the two do not always necessarily align uh, in terms of how that works. Uh, the way we structure our program from ninth through 12th, and you kind of, I think you've heard us say it a couple of times, uh, we are trying to build students from a skills perspective to get to that point where by the time they enter the IB diploma program years formally in grade 11, they're prepared for the content that they're about to uh, encounter, but they're also very prepared from a skills-based perspective. And so that application to ninth grade from an MYP program for us is, is still very important, regardless of where you're coming from around. Great, thanks. Um, Mr. Grills, uh, I know this question has come up a couple of times in the chat. Uh, could you talk about the IB specific teacher training uh, that our staff have? Yeah, thank you. So all of our teachers at, at, at both of our schools, Maryvale and Colonel By, are Ontario certified teachers. Um, so uh, everyone at both schools are, are certified teachers, uh, but we do uh, offer our IB teachers additional training um, for their, their subject area. And so uh, not only, like I said, are they certified teachers, they also have additional training and they the support through uh, Mr. Hearth and Ms. Lee and Ms. Dutton um, in, their, in their subject areas to make sure that we are um, uh, aligned with the, the curriculum that, that teachers are, are looking to deliver for the, in the IB program. Great, thanks. Uh, Mr. Harthen, a couple of questions have come up about um, program fees. Would you like to address that? Yes, uh, as I think we had in our FAQ portion, uh, the program does carry with it uh, an annual fee and families are responsible for the uh, cost of IB examinations in 11th and 12th grade. And those uh, costs are set by the IBO for the examination uh, fees. They tell us uh, what the costs to them are. Um, so typically, yes, there is an annual fee uh, associated with the program. And yes, families are responsible in 11th and 12th grade. However, at both schools, uh, we are very conscious of making this uh, an equitable program for all students and all families. And so we do offer financial assistance. So we don't want any families uh, perhaps watching this, uh, thinking that they couldn't afford the program or anything of that sort. We do provide financial assistance where that's required. We never want money to be a barrier to a student being able to access the program. Thank you. Uh, could you uh, spend a few minutes talking about um, IB student recognition at post-secondary institutions? I've seen quite a few questions about um, how, how uh, Canadian universities and international universities uh, consider IB uh, learning and the students on the IB diploma pathway. Yeah, it is. So when it comes to post-secondary, those colleges and universities, um, every college and university has their own sometimes specific take. What I will tell you at the Canadian level, um, students uh, qualify for um, that first year credit and whatnot based on the courses that they take at what IB calls higher level. Uh, and so that uh, opens up credit opportunities for uh, students. Uh, in terms of uh, the United States, or if we're looking at Europe or other places in the world, um, each of them will have a slightly different uh, approach to how they view the IB program. Um, they all consider it, they all recognize it, they all value it. Um, but if you were to visit every single university, you will see different sort of things as far as what they talk about when it comes to the program. But 
Uh, it does give students an international credential. They can go into any country in the world with an IB diploma program. Uh, and instantly the university officer uh, at that program, uh, when they're considering them for admissions, will understand what it means to have achieved the IB diploma and what their scores in those IB diploma subjects mean. So it's a very universally accepted uh, piece for our students to have. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lee or Ms. Dutton, uh, did either of you want to comment on whether a student uh, leaving grade eight and entering grade nine should be taking a summer school course? Can we take that? Um, yeah, there is there is absolutely no need for uh, students to take a summer school course before entering the program. Um, and we would caution students that because our pre-IB program is necessary to build the skills that they're going to need uh, for the diploma program in grade 11 and 12, uh, that some of the courses that they might choose uh, would not then preempt them from taking our pre-diploma course uh, when they they start in the program with us. So if they want to take a course for interest, if they want to take something for fun, uh, they can, but they are not getting a jump start on their diploma program requirements. We really need them in our pre-DP courses so that they get all those skills that are specific to the IB diploma program that we want them to gain. Thank you. Uh, uh, technical questions. Uh, what happens if a student is taking their uh, or completing their math exercise and there is an internet glitch or some other problem to the completion of that task? Uh, who would like to talk technology? Sure. Um, if that were to occur, what we ask is what, it, when and if it occurs, um, that you send us an email uh, immediately uh, alerting us to what the situation might be. Uh, if that were the case, we would reach out to you uh, and try to make an alternative arrangement uh, in that situation. So if it does happen, um, then please just let us know. And like we say, please let us know in a timely fashion uh, so uh, we can get back to you as soon as possible and help you. Great. And, and families do select the date uh, which their student will be completing those tasks. So please make sure you read uh, those choices carefully and uh, choose the one that, that best meets your family's needs. Uh, Mr. Harthen, a skill testing question. If a student uh, enters the program uh, from an Ontario program in grade nine to the pre-DP program in grade 10, um, how are they going to be supported to be ready for grade 10? Yeah, great question. And so uh, if a student comes to us as a ninth grade student applying for, for 10th grade, uh, one of the pieces that we do, uh, math is probably the, uh, the biggest area here. Sometimes we have students uh, take a math course uh, in the summer or access it in a different way prior to that so that they can be at the same learning point as their peers. But more specifically, what we try to do uh, at the school is we try to spend a, a little bit more time with students like that. And we try to connect them to our learning professionals here who can help develop some of that skill set that their uh, peers might have been developing in, in ninth grade. And so we try to, at both schools, we have quite a few learning professionals devoted to different uh, aspects uh, of helping students. And we want them to know that they'll be well supported uh, at the school to help them get ready. Okay. Uh, Mr. Grills, I'm coming back to you with more transportation questions. Uh, students who may live outside of the OC Transpo service area and um, students who um, are concerned about travel times. Yeah, so so travel time is, is something absolutely to consider when you're considering applying to the program. Um, we, we can't control where the OC transfer buses go or how long the transportation takes to get here. Um, and so that that is a consideration um, to think about when you're applying to the program. Um, typically when you're outside of the OC transpo area, um, that is the work that OSTA does to determine um, what is the mode of transportation to get here? Um, what is the, um, where, where do people get picked up? Is it a common spot? Uh, how many common spots exist in those outlying rural areas? So all factors to consider when you're applying to the program. Um, we, we will make sure that uh, our work with OSTA will help folks get here, uh, but we, we, that, is, that is something beyond our control um, as we've seen this year. 
Great, thank you. Uh, another question for our coordinator group. Um, students with uh, competitive interests outside of school, whether it is uh, arts, uh, athletics, um, how can those students um, balance uh, their schoolwork and their extracurricular commitments, particularly if they're at a high level? Yeah, um, the, the honest answer is that this is a very student specific question. And so what I can tell you uh, from my experience at, at both schools uh, is that we have students who are involved at uh, incredibly high levels, be it uh, athletics or, or the arts or various things. Um, and so part of it is learning time management. Uh, what I always like to point out to students who uh, are at that level athletically or artistically or in another fashion is you probably already actually have some really strong time management skills because that particular activity is, um, is part of your life right now. And so uh, we try to work with you uh, to make school uh, an equal part of, of your life in that fashion. Um, so is it possible to do your activities and be part of this program at Maryvale or Colonel By? Absolutely. Uh, we work with you to try to make that possible. Um, but I also want to say to families, it's also a personal decision. So for a student, um, they have to understand that we're talking about time management and working that into their life uh, and to be receptive to that. And so uh, I've definitely seen it be very successful. We've had students go on at both schools to do uh, a lot of tremendous extracurriculars uh, outside of the classroom and out in the community and out in the world in different places. Um, so I know it can work uh, and we would work with you to make that work for you if that's something you wanted to pursue. Great, thank you. Uh, probably time for one to two more questions and then um, we are at time, it is 8 p.m. Um, before uh, we close though, Mr. Harth and I would ask that you put up the uh, how to contact the coordinators mm -hmm. slide so that if uh, families feel they have an individual question that they need to ask directly to you, the, that uh, we get that information to them. Um, so uh, just a, a quick sort of uh, uh, look at um, uh, Mr. Grills. Uh, do students uh, choose courses they want to attend and the times that work for them how do we build grade nine timetables? Thanks for the, the question. So, uh, so for grade students in grade nine, uh, you do get a little bit of choice in your, in your schedule, um, meaning that you would get to pick your art, you get to pick your elective. Um, but uh, when we build schedules, uh, we really look to at the entire school to balance all students to fit in all of the classes. Um, and so you don't necessarily get to pick that you want math in the morning or English in the afternoon. Uh, we will build your schedule for you. Um, you will get the choice. Uh, you will get a couple of choices that you get to make at each school. Great. Thank you. I actually have two more questions that I, I think are really important. Uh, it, what would be one way, Mr. Harthen, that you would help families to understand the distinction between the Ontario program and uh, the IB program? And, and the unique features of IB and, and what might help a family choose? Yeah, um, great question. So uh, first, just to say, we, we value both programs. Uh, obviously at both schools, we consider both to be tremendous programs. Um, so from an IB perspective, and, and you heard Mr. Grills talk about it a little bit, uh, in grade nine and 10, um, four to five of the subjects that you take will be IB specific. And so, in those IB specific classes, uh, what we focus on uh, is that slightly different skill set that we know becomes really important uh, in 11th and 12th grade in our diploma program pathway classes. And so we look at those. In other situations, in our other four or five, four classes that a student might have, um, students are co seated with students pursuing the Ontario Secondary School Diploma, which we consider to be uh, valuable as well. And so in those classes, we know that some of the skills that are being developed there will ultimately be well served to students uh, in 11th and 12th grade uh, later on. And so for a family kind of uh, thinking about both, uh, what I would tell you is it's really a skill set focus in 9th and 10th grade that we are uh, specifically focused on. And we're looking to develop a particular area um, a little bit more because we know that that's what 
ultimately when it comes to the IB evaluations and examinations in 11th and 12th grade, that that's what IB is focused on. So uh, we're looking to develop that. And then in terms of uh, graduation requirement, uh, it's largely down uh, for families to consider. And so I think we talked a little bit about how colleges and universities uh, view the program. And so um, if that's a consideration of interest to families, that, that might be something for them to consider. Um, obviously, completing an IB diploma and an Ontario Secondary School diploma, uh, the possible pathways after both are still post-secondary studies. And so uh, we encourage families to kind of think about which high, what kind of high school experience they'd like in terms of, do I want to take uh, different subjects uh, as a requirement all across high school? Do I want to focus on, on something of that sort? Um, is that TOK type discussion something that my child will really want to have in every single course? Uh, and if it is, then, and then perhaps this is the program for your child to consider. It. And perhaps if it's not, there are other alternatives for, for students to consider. Uh, I just want to add uh, that we know that it is a family choice. We know that parents will be driving um, their students uh, for certain uh, school-based activities that they have joined for activities for clubs for uh, music nights, for the production uh, to pick up after that varsity rugby game. So we know that that together with your student, you're going to make the decision that's right for you. And, and we certainly welcome the opportunity to, to connect with you individually for very specific questions. Uh, there were two other questions regarding application processes as it pertains to home address. You do need to live in Ottawa Carleton um, at the time that school starts. And you need to have a residential address in the zone that um, you have selected. So if you are applying to um, the IB program, you must indicate which school uh, that you are uh, seeking consideration from. And that is based on your home address. And the boundary is set by the board. So we ask that families um, uh, recognize that, that parameter that we have. Um, and... Um, Again, a lot of this information, including this uh, presentation and the frequently asked questions will be linked to the OCDSB website. Uh, obviously our coordinators uh, are going to make themselves available um, for questions through through email. I would ask that, that families um, be a little bit patient in the reply. We often see a high volume of email after sessions such as this. And so you, you will need to give the coordinators a couple of business days to get back to you. Uh, and they will do the best they can with that volume. Mr. Grills, any closing remarks? No, I'd just like to echo what you said. I think it's a, it really is a family decision when um, when looking forward to the application and looking to your decision next year. And we we wish everyone the best of luck and 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 we look forward to meeting you in, in person. Coordinators. Thank you very much, folks. I very much appreciate your time. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time tonight. We look forward uh, to welcoming you uh, should you choose to apply.